Welcome to To The Point. This past week, Governor Whitmer signed the budget the legislature passed just in time for the new fiscal year that began on Friday. The $70 billion plan includes spending for roads and bridges and skills training, tuition, free education for some, as well as expanded child care and money to do it away with lead pipes and PFAS remediation. But there's much more in the plan. We talked to two state House members about some of the projects that they wanted to see in the budget, beginning with Republican Representative Mary Whiteford from Allegan County. Representative, let's talk about this budget process. The Treasury ended up being uh, more full than expected by what, about $3 billion or in that neighborhood, or actually more because you were, I think there was a uh, expected shortfall. So when this budget went together, there was money for some things that might not otherwise have been expected. Uh, tell me about that process and some of the things that you take away from that budget that you see as positive. Well, when I worked on my budget, we started back in February to figure out what our priorities were. And I always look at it as something sustainable. So out of a now $30.6 billion Health and Human Services budget, we normally have about $5 billion of general fund to work with. And I always kept consistent with that. Um, as this played out, that's what I focused on. A lot of things are unchangeable, and what that is is caseloads. You know, the number of foster kids or the number of people on Medicaid. Um, other things like how much federal match do we get on, on our Medicaid money. So that was really important to me. We had some one-time things that we had some ability to work with, but we always have some one-time projects we can work with. But for me, it's making sure that our budget is balanced and that it's sustainable going into the following years. Um, and that's huge on caseloads and how we do this work. That is such a big part of the budget. I mean, and you point out that some of that money just is going to go where it's going to go because it's federal pass-through money. There's nothing you can do about it. What were some of the things that you were able to focus on that, that might have been somewhat out of the purview of the, the federal guideline? Yeah, so I'm chair of an adoption and foster care task force. I had never really delved into that subject and our foster kids, when I first started a couple years ago, we were at about 13,000 foster children who are wards of the state, 100% the state's responsibility. Um, and it's now down to about 10,500 kids. And that's concerning too with the pandemic and children not going to school. But for me, I found out that there is a lot of issues that these families face, that these agencies face. About 60% of our foster kids are actually under the purview of private agencies like Bethany, uh, and that they had very low rates of reimbursement compared to what state employees were getting for the same work. And I'm really working hard to have champions for every one of these children, and they don't have them in many ways. And to have a champion, you need to make sure that there's a consistent workforce and that these foster care workers are consistent. And if their, their um, salaries are really low, they're gonna go on to something else. And that's a huge issue. So my priority, and probably the biggest priority in this budget, was making sure that we had a way for these agencies and these foster care workers to get paid properly. So we did have the largest increase in Michigan's history to that line item to make sure that we have that consistency for these children. You have talked with me about this before and that sometimes these children are in this cyclical pattern that their parents didn't have parenting skills because the parents before them didn't have parenting skills. I know that's been a passion of yours in trying to focus on it. During a pandemic, how difficult is it to keep track uh, of those children and to find workers to fill those spots no matter what the pay level is because we know that there's a worker shortage in virtually every area. Yeah, there is. And so um, I just look at the attitude of um, workers and why somebody would go into a career. Um, if you're not able to pay your bills, if you're not able to feed your family, you're going to go and do something else. So how do we make sure that we build up that base? And in the past, there's been just amounts of money just kind of spot, spot checking um, these issues around the state. And I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how can we build up, bring the ship up so every child gets the support that they need. And that's why when it came to rates, that was important. A lot of these children aren't seeing the doctor because they're on different Medicaid health plans or they're on the foster care family's health plan. And so these kiddos are going months without seeing a doctor and making sure that their medical care was consistent. So one of the recommendations and things that I funded was a one-time use of funds so that we can figure out what kind of health plan can we have so that every child can be on the same one that just follows them from the moment that they enter the system. 
until they end up with a forever family. Uh, so that was another um, barrier that we found. We found that these kids could be rescued in the middle of the night, but they can't get an outfit or some food, and so we set aside money for that. So we, I really tried to be creative in how we're addressing our child welfare system and making sure that these children, these kiddos get the help that they need, and the families do too. Family preservation is huge. We need to make sure that parents who have lost their children, just like you said, many times they don't have the parenting skills that other people do. Um, they may have been former foster children. They may have been in a family that was a hot mess and they need that extra support. And so really making sure that we have a champion within the foster care world is really crucial. Um, guardians ad litem, I found that's a big deal. Um, kids don't have attorneys, but through, this, through statute they have guardian ad litems. What I found is every county treats them differently, reimburses them differently. They could have you know, five attorneys who are rotated among every child. Some counties have one guardian ad litem, so an attorney for these children in the child welfare system. So we're working on some pilots. So I have one in Kent County, another in Bay County, to try to figure out a better mechanism to ensure that we've got attorneys ready and willing with trauma-informed training to be able to properly represent these children as well. So I'm really glad that I'm able to bring something to the Grand Rapids community, Kent County, to try to make this better. One of the, the things that you have also worked on, we were talking about this before we came into the office, but it occurs to me that these two may have a linkage, unfortunately, and you've been working on trafficking and trying to find uh, more resources to help folks um, escape that. But uh, when, you, when you have children who are otherwise in a bad situation, it probably makes them more vulnerable. So talk to me about your efforts there and what you think, and, and I appreciate that not everything that you're talking about is just from the state perspective. There's also uh, a private component to some of these things, I would assume, because it's going to take an effort, not just a singular effort. But talk to me about traffic and, and what you believe um, you as a, a member of the legislature and or the state can do to somehow, I hate to use the word stop, but greatly reduce traffic. It's a perfect segue because the average age of a child, a boy or a girl, to go into sex trafficking is 15. Well, what had that child um, determined that somebody else was more trustworthy than their family? You know, they could have um, difficulty with their parents, their family is struggling, and then the child finds somebody else they trust more and they willingly walk away. So what, what we've done, I'm the lead sponsor of a 23 bill package just trying to add some more forgiveness to somebody who has survived sex trafficking and had other charges besides prostitution, and they have a chance to get those um, taken off their record. But over and over again, I've had awareness days, I've had FBI agents, I've had victors who were formerly trafficked and they go and fight for their friends, who said, Mary, you're not doing anything unless you're making sure that there's a place for people to go when they're rescued. Um, there's several model programs around the state uh, and so what we did, and it's, t it's years in the making, was I got FBI agents, I got survivors, victors. Um, I also invited different um, organizations who have successful programs around the state to come and say, you know, this is what we're doing. We have medical services, we've got college classes to help um, these, in this case, women, but men too, to be able to start a new life and reprogram themselves and get those skills and the confidence to move on and become a successful adult. And so I work closely with the department too to be able to use some victim of crime funds uh, to build up these systems. And then one of my focuses is West Michigan. We don't have a really great program in the Grand Rapids, West Michigan area. So I've got everybody together out there um, coming together with a plan that they want to do. And we'll be able to have three to five million dollars around the state over the next couple years to develop these programs, build out these programs, and there will be no wrong door for somebody who is rescued to get that second chance to get their life together. So it, it sounds like a clearinghouse where you can go and, and get all of these services. Do we have a handle on the scope uh, of this problem, how big it is? We hear a, a lot about it um, and, and, and people, you have talked to me uh, over the past few years um, about the problem, but, but do, do we really know how many uh, people are impacted by this? We don't, it's very anecdotal, and that's why it was really important that I did have these agents come on 
into my meetings and describe what they're doing and where the safe places are to go and the challenges that they face. So I'm just talking to people who are boots on the ground and seeing what kind of challenges and barriers they face in trying to help these women and men um, get a second chance at life. And so that's why them telling me how important that was made me realize we really have to put our focus and energy on these places. Um, and it's really under the wire and you know, it's uncomfortable. It's not an easy thing to hear about. And we could say, oh, human trafficking, we're saving people, but what's the nitty gritty? How are we actually going in effect, affecting that person's life? And that's why all this boots on the ground, teamwork is so important. And I'm really trying to make sure that our communities have the tools to be able to do this because there's a lot of really caring people out there, but th sometimes they just don't talk to each other. And that's the key in this. Um, I, mean, I think it's really gonna put us in a better direction. There will always be people who are exploiting others. It'll always happen. Um, that's why one of my biggest priorities and one of the priorities of my budget is making sure that we have early intervention, early access for children who have been traumatized. So whether it's school-based or community-based, we have to have no wrong door for children and adults who are facing anxiety, depression, or other mental illness. Uh, I've got the Michigan Crisis and Access Line that I worked three years to get signed into law. It's live as a pilot in Oakland County in the Upper Peninsula, and the governor has made a commitment to have it go live statewide um, next year and into 23. Um, so that there is no wrong door. Nobody will ever be hung up on. People won't be languishing in emergency rooms not knowing where to go. You'll have a, a way to contact somebody and find the right place to go and get those supports. While the budget has been in place, the spending is likely not over. Later, we'll talk about how much more money the legislature and governor may have to deal with. But when we come back, Muskegon County Democratic Representative Terry Sato says he thinks the new budget brings some equity for this part of the state. That's next, To The Point. Welcome back to To The Point. The governor and legislature agreed after their first disastrous budget process that to keep things on track and not stretch out the process until the October 1st deadline, they would get the spending plan done by July 1st. As it turns out, the safety valve included in that agreement was necessary in the first two years it was in place. So while the school aid fund was complete this summer, the full budget was not completed until the week before last and signed just this past week, two days before it went into effect. Despite the delay, legislators on both sides of the aisle seem pleased with at least some of the provisions included in the spending plan. Here is our conversation with Democratic State Representative Terry Sabo from Muskegon County. Representative, I'm going to start in a little different place than we normally do. When we talk about budgets, historically we talk about how do you squeeze enough out of a budget to get things done in the state? And that's been kind of where we have been for over 20 plus years. This year is a little different and different, yeah. I, I think, against type because there was an estimated $3 billion shortage in this budget that ended up being more than $3 billion, and I never say surplus because it's still revenue, but more money than expected. And consequently, uh, there are a lot of areas that have been touched that might not have received um, attention from the budget in the past. Talk to me a little bit from your perspective. Uh, we were just talking about Muskegon and some of the, the really remarkable transformation that has been made there. But in this budget, uh, what, uh, what do you find for your district? Uh, what did I find in uh, in this budget uh, locally? I found uh, some some equity, some uh, some recognition that uh, West Michigan has really come a long ways, and that um, and that we deserve a lot of the resources that Southeast Michigan is getting. And so, uh, with this budget, uh, when I uh, was able to advocate for a few different projects that were very specific to West Michigan and um, to the Greater Muskegon area, um, it, it really made me happy to to see that come to fruition. And because it truly is about the redevelopment of the greater Muskegon area. We, uh, and I think I said this the last time we did the show, but if people haven't been Muskegon even in a few months, but certainly yeah. in a few years, um, I was stunned by part of that transformation. Uh, but just some of the community involvement and what people are, are doing is one thing. But as you point out, getting recognition and having the state step up 
um, to help all parts of the state. But mm -hmm. you know, obviously, uh, you're a representative from Muskegon, yeah. and that's uh, that's your point of interest. What what did you find in the budget specifically that will work to help your constituents? Well, um, as you said, I mean, Muskegon has just come so far. And I don't want to say just the city of Muskegon, because really it is the whole greater Muskegon area. We've come so far in the last few years, and I always uh, ask people whenever I talk to them around the state, hey, when was the last time you've been to Muskegon, uh, been to the area? And um, if you haven't been there in the last uh, 10 years, you really need to come back and see what's going on, because there's so much development happening. Uh, a lot of great things are happening in the, in all of West Michigan. So, but specifically in this budget, um, we were able to get in some funding for a few different projects. Um, there was money in there for the Harbor 31 project for some environmental remediation, which is located uh, on the shores of Muskegon Lake. But also there was, I was able to secure some partial funding for the Third Street Dock project which really goes with the city's master plan in getting some of, more of the industrial activity down on the eastern end of Muskegon Lake and moving some other things back into downtown Muskegon, really connecting the downtown area with Muskegon Lake in the, in the beautiful lakeshore that we have there. Uh, but then there was some other programs as well, one being uh, a tri-share program involving healthcare um, for some of our, for, for some of the folks that are working and they don't, weren't, wouldn't be able to get health care um, through their employer, but this is a, a program that involves three different um, aspects to pay for that health care. So people are off from the, the state system and onto their own health care plan. But then also uh, another program called the health or uh, ex exit program. And that will, is involved with uh, people who are incarcerated, doesn't allow them to get out of jail early but it allows them to learn some of the life skills that are gonna be needed once they do get out of jail to keep them from coming back to jail. So those are, the, those are three of the projects that I was heavily involved in. Let's talk about that, the latter one, because one of the things that has happened in Lansing over the past few years is there has been a real focus on criminal justice reform. We've seen expungement laws go into place. Um, We've seen uh, the lieutenant governor who went around the state listening and, and talking about those kind of things, and now a program that will help people, as you say, learn life skills. How important is it that, uh, from a state standpoint, that you, you continue the effort of trying to, to get people back in, uh, if I can use the term mainstream, mm -hmm. uh, of society that have had their encounters with law enforcement and being incarcerated. Yeah, you know, I, one of the things that I've noticed in my past uh, professional career of being in the police, uh, being a police officer, firefighter, public safety, being involved in the community, um, you know, people can get into trouble and they get incarcerated. I mean, it, unfortunately it happens. Um, but my goal when I look at this with this exit program uh, is that let's try to teach people that, listen, going to jail is not a part of life, okay? It's really something that should be very few and far between um, of people going. So let's try to turn them around and teach them that, you know, there's so much more to life than being a part of a, uh, than going to jail. Um, let's teach them how to be good citizens. Let's teach them how those job skills so that they can, once they get out of jail, that they can go and get that job that's going to help support them and their family. Um, I know the prosecutor in Muskegon County has said many times, the best way to keep people from going to jail is to get them a job. Let's get them to work. So I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. And um, that's one of the things that I like about the program is let's try to keep people out of jail and, uh, and teach them how to lead a better life. This budget process was unusual, it was going to be unusual no matter what. Uh, the amount of revenue that changed, uh, the amount of federal revenue, much of that still exists. And you guys will be doing supplementals, I assume, through the end of the year, maybe yeah. even first next year. I don't know how long that'll go. Um, and the process took a long time. And uh, I know there were some people who um, questioned why it took so long to get a budget put together. Mm -hmm. um, but there were a lot of things to consider. And, and whether or not you know it should have or could have been done earlier, I, I guess, hardly matters now. But from your perspective, um, biggest budget ever passed. Um, was this a, a good process? Do you feel like in the end, the product that was produced obviously meets some needs for your constituents, but 
overall, do you think that this is a budget that meets the needs of the state of Michigan, given the re really difficult place we've been in? Yeah, I, I do. I really do. Um, I wasn't a fan of the process, the way it was going this budget cycle uh, initially. But I can tell you that as this moved on and we finally got everybody to the table to actually negotiate and get something done to where, you know, we, we all were able to see some of our priorities come together, Republicans, Democrats, uh, that to me, that was a big deal. And I think that the budget itself shows that, that negotiation process because uh, I think the big winners, you know, obviously I think Muskegon County was a big winner. But I also think the state of Michigan was a, a big winner because we figured out how to get past our differences and, and actually put something together for the people and uh, push politics aside. Well, and the reality is that it's not just Muskegon because everybody got yeah. something. I mean, oh, there, yeah. there was a lot of money to go around in this budget, which is, brings me to the next question. And we can't look too far uh, into the future, but it's hard to say what the next budget cycle is going to look like. We don't know what the economy is going mm -hmm. to do. We don't know what the federal government is going to do, if they have an infrastructure plan, how that impacts uh, the state of Michigan. Are you concerned that this budget is sustainable going forward? I mean, again, it's impossible to know the numbers. But. Yeah, I, you know, no, I don't think it is sustainable. Um, you know, because, you know, a lot of this money that we're, we've, some of the money that we spent in this budget, this fiscal year budget, as well as m some of the money that's coming forward in supplemental budgets here in the future, it's one-time funding. So, you know, that remains to be seen. I would not count on that as uh, being sustainable. But I think as long as we continue as um, government officials in drafting a budget that puts people first, we can't go wrong. Because, I, you know, that's, to me, that's what it's all about. That's what we're here for, is to serve people. And it doesn't even necessarily uh, have to mean about a lot of money. It's about where are we spending that money. And so that's, uh, that's what I look forward to as we start this next process. I know there are a lot of voices that will be uh, talking about what happens with the federal money that is currently uh, available and what may become available. I mean, it, again, we don't, we, as you and I sit here right now, we don't know uh, what that's going to look like. Um, are you, do you have a view of what some of that money should be used for, understanding that some of it will be earmarked and mm -hmm. you know you won't make a, be able to make a choice with it. Yeah, I think we really should be focusing on some of the one-time projects that can really move our state forward or take care of some of the issues that we have. Uh, to to put it towards programs that are going to be long-lasting, I think is a I really believe is a dangerous step because we're going to have to figure out a way to fund that in years to come. So I don't know if I want to take on that big of a challenge. Um, because I think the future is too unknown. But I think when we can take care of some of the urgent issues that we have now as a state, that's where we ought to be spending the money at. The budget is now in place, and what we normally think of as typical government functions will continue seamlessly. But that's not the end of the appropriations process. Because state revenues came in as much as $6 billion more than expected, and because the federal money that's been flowing since last year there may be as much as eight to nine billion more dollars that are at the disposal of legislators and the governor. But that money comes with a potential hidden liability. We'll talk about that next to the point. The agreement on the budget has given rise to some optimism that the relationship between the governor and legislature, almost not existent at some points during the pandemic, could be improving. But with so much money still on the table and a lot of that one time money, both sides will have to be cautious to spend it in such a way it does not obligate the state to continue spending on projects into the future when that one-time money, especially from the federal government, may not be there again. That alone may be enough to test that relationship even more. No matter, we'll be watching each week right here with you to the point.